Chapter 8, The Dynamic Planet. In this chapter, we're going to look at a little geologic history. How did we develop the current theories and ideas about uh, the planet and the movement of uh, tectonic plates, the creation of landforms? In much of the early uh, scientific thought, the belief that the world was created in seven days based on, on biblical uh, theories and ideas was really the prominent um, scientific theory and people believed in what was called catastrophism that uh, great floods uh, wiped out every living thing that the world was sculpted created and developed in just a few days in the early 1700s uh, a scientist and scholar and, and traveler a geographer named James Hutton who lived in Scotland began to really challenge those theories. There were a couple things that he looked at. One, he looked at these uh, walls that had been built but when, when Rome uh, occupied England and they were known to be 2,000 years old or so, uh, or close to that and, that, and yet the walls were in great repair. Then he compared this to a landscape close to his home and here is a very craggy uh, worn away eroded mountain range and what he noticed is that many of these features looked like current volcanic active uh, landscapes and yet these were very eroded and very worn down and he began to kind of put two and two together and think about the fact that wait a minute you know if those walls are still in good repair after 2000 years these mountains had to be much older and he was branded as a heretic but it was really the beginning of pushing back uh, the age of the earth and the belief in that. Sir Charles Lyell in the late 1700s, early 1800s added to this uh, theory with his idea of uniformitarianism. And he, he said if you go around and you look at the landscape and you look at the features that are happening today, uh, those are the same processes that were happening in the past and you can begin to understand uh, landform development. So let's jump to uh, Oregon and in the 1930s, Dr. Cressman found uh, artifacts, these sandals, or a sandal, um, that was created uh, at, from radiocarbon dating that was identified to be about 13,000 years old. And uh, they were sandals that were believed to have been worn in a very wet environment. Um, and yet, the environment that that was found in looks like this. Uh, this is Fort Rock Basin and in the center you can see this big volcanic ring uh, and around that ring is very flat uh, dry arid landscape and this is the basin uh, from an aerial view and you see that open end of the basin um, here and here and over here have very specific features and when you get to the edge of these features you notice you can see where there's a platform and there's what's called um, a notch and, and the rock right here is very smooth and worn away and he was just kind of dumbfounded at uh, just the way the structure looked and then one day he was at the coast and he noticed a very similar uh, landform or structure and, and he noticed that here on the on the coast uh, this is obviously not a picture from that time uh, there was a notch that was created by waves and so he began to really think about what he had seen in the Fort Rock Basin and and look at other areas and he thought I wonder if there's some way water could have been uh, here to form that that area and he found lots of evidence um, to suggest and support that uh, sure enough, the landscape that he was looking at today that was actively being formed by water, uh, that process created uh, the landforms in the Fort Rock Basin that indeed at some point in history there had been a huge uh, inner basin lake that had filled that area. So that really supports uh, Lyle's idea of uniformitarianism. So the book talks uh, takes you through some sense of uh, time looking at uh, the geologic time scale, eras, epochs, um, and what I really want you to 
kind of think about for this cl class is the Holocene period. Uh, why, why does that uh, 11,000, 10,000 year ago period, why does that correlate with so much historic cultural development, the development of cities, the development of agriculture? Uh, it was the time when the ice was in retreat and the planet warmed up. Um, and the book talks about the fact that this geologic time scale was created first by um, relative dating methods. And we'll, we'll look at some ideas of relative dating and then currently more by absolute dating methods. So to understand relative data, data you have to understand uh, stratigraphy or the law of stratification. And this is a principle that says um, that layers of the earth are put down horizontally uh, for the most part, and the layers at the bottom are the oldest. And so if I were to look at this uh, image number two, um, there's all these different layers of rock, um, and each layer was created uh, in a different environment, and the rock on the bottom is the oldest. And so if I were to find a fossil in that uh, bottom layer of rock, it would be an older fossil than a fossil in the top layer of rock. And this is, a, this is based on the idea that these layers have not been disturbed. There hasn't been an earthquake that's moved them or a big wave that's kind of changed their position. But that's the basic law of, uh, oh, we're having a dynamic movement of our house to move these back up. Sorry about that. So that's the idea of relative dating, is that um, I can, you can, a scientist can uh, identify different layers of rock. So if I look at the bottom uh, of this uh, chart here, um, there is some, some limestone. Um, let's point right here. So there's a limestone layer, and there's some fish fossils in that limestone. And uh, that probably means then this was some kind of ocean bottom. And then at some point, the limestone is covered by sand, uh, and the sand might have some shell, and so that might indicate a, a more shallow water environment, where as you move up further, you get cross bedding. So this is kind of could mean uh, sandstone uh, or sand dunes that have covered that area. And so what this, this little piece would be suggesting is that an ocean layer that's somehow been uh, moved up to shallow water that's been uh, that has had active dunes on it. So this is all um, relative data, looking at the different stratigraphy or the different layers uh, in, in a rock bed. Absolute dating uh, gives you a, a, a recorded number based on different scientific principles, and so the one everybody talks about is carbon dating. Uh, carbon dating is only good to about 40,000 years in the past, so there have been other kinds of dating uh, methods that are used here are some um, that allow scientists to understand. Uh, you can use potassium argon dating, um, which looks at um, the amount of potassium argon uh, that's in a rock uh, and can and take that back to uh, 1.2 billion years or 106 billion years. So. Absolute dating gives you a specific time, just like absolute location gives you a number in a specific location. Uh, relative dating gives you uh, dating based on the existence of other fossils. So then we're moving in. The book goes into talking about um, the structure of the Earth. It gives you a cross section, talks about the core, uh, this heavy uh, nickel um, radio radioactive um, dynamic core that's spinning, that spinning causes kind of the, the magnetic field. Above the core is the mantle. Um, it will give you several examples of the upper mantle and the lower mantle. And um, at the upper mantle is full of, is, uh, contains what's the asthenosphere, which is a very hot rock that's considered plastic. In other words, it moves. And just like we looked at convection currents in the atmosphere or in water, there are convection currents in the Earth's interior. Um, and there's a couple videos that you can watch that, that talk about this. But that convection current in this upper, upper mantle causes this rock, 
or this plastic rock to actually have convection currents. Uh, and then as they move, they affect the lithosph lithosphere. It's very late and I'm having trouble talking. Anyway, so that's kind of some of the basics the book talks uh, takes you through. And then it introduces the work of Alfred Wegener, who uh, was a scientist who um, began to look at the, the shape of the Earth and began to look at some of the fossil record. And he uh, really was intrigued by the fact that, um, I'm going to go back to this slide, that it, it's really looked like pieces of a puzzle, that this part of South America really looked like it could snug right in here to uh, Africa and in fact what he found was some interesting fossils in one side of South America that matched up very nicely with fossils in Africa and uh, he began to kind of come up with this idea of continental drift uh, and he did the, he came he uh, supported this theory using uh, lots of information one was fossil records, so if he put these continents together, he found existence of different fossils uh, and different flora that really supported his idea. Um, additionally, there's been work that showed uh, evidence of glacial uh, activity where there historically had not been glacial activity. And again, this was a scientist who was pretty early uh, in, in his thought and not very well respected until uh, the development of uh, uh, the magnetic record on the seafloor. So what, what, we've, what scientists have been able to put together is that there are several plates uh, or uh, uh, kind of like if you cracked, if you had a hard-boiled egg and, and kind of cracked up the shell, these, there's individual plates along the surface of the earth that have moved in and out through uh, tectonic movement or through the movement of the uh, lava through the, uh, or the magma uh, in the asthenosphere. So we can kind of look back in time at the different positions of the continents as uh, Ugh, this silly computer is giving me a fit today. Hold on, here we go. There we go. So this this work was um, com was supported by some work uh, done by Hess uh, in uh, the early 1950s and 60s, and it's based on this idea that we have this magnetic. Uh, field around the Earth. We have a North Pole and a South Pole, and at times in the past, these poles have reversed. So in other words, if you have hot magma uh, flowing out um, on the Earth's surface, and there are iron uh, minerals in that, in that magma, or in that lava, that as it cools, those iron filings will align themselves north to south, just like a magnet does. Um, and so uh, in the 50s, there was some work done with a flux magnetometer, um, and they dragged this kind of over uh, the ocean bed, and they recorded the magnetism, and what they noticed was that on either side of these mountain ranges that were along the ocean, um, they noticed that the positive and negative uh, polarity of the rock beds changed, uh, but they changed in parallel on either side of of the uh, ocean floor. And so with this work, they were able to support uh, Wagner's theory that the Earth, oh, oh, the other part of this, I'm sorry, was that the rocks were never older than 200 or some million years old, and yet we know the planet to be much older than that. And so what they were able to do with all of this, the um, geologic record, the um, mag magnetometer and looking at the magnetic reversal to support Wagner's original theory of plate tectonics. So what we have now are these uh, major plate boundaries um, around the Earth, and uh, this is considered the ring of fire. This is an area that is very active tectonically. Oregon is on this little tiny piece of a plate called the Juan de Fuca plate, and this plate is moving underneath uh, the North America continent, and in so many millions of years, that plate will completely uh, disappear. So make sure you understand this idea of magma 
um, in the upper mantle moving. So as the magma gets heated here, it becomes more buoyant and it rises. As it rises, it cools, creates a current. This looks like the Hadley cells in uh, when we were looking at atmospheric circulation. Um, and several different interactions happen uh, as these 